Don't ever shy away from our progressive values. One person's socialism is another person's neighborliness. I am genuinely stunned right now. Stunned. Because as long as I can remember, Democrats have always ignored their base and made the most idiotic, baffling decisions imaginable that are beyond comprehension. You've heard me complaining if you've been subscribed for a long time. And since I'm so used to being disappointed by the Democratic Party, I fully expected to wake up and find out that Kamala Harris chose Josh Shapiro as her running mate. And because I had that expectation, because I'm so primed to expect disappointment from Democrats, I was kind of dreading this announcement today. Because at least if I don't know, I can be naively optimistic before waking up and finding out who she chose. And then, you know, we come back to reality and the dread sets in. But I wake up and the opposite of what I expected actually happened. So I open Twitter when I get up and this is the first tweet that I see. It's from Tim Waltz. And guess what he says? It is the honor of a lifetime to join Kamala Harris in this campaign. I'm all in. What the fuck? Now, my initial response right there that I tweeted is 10 seconds after I woke up. That's what I saw. That's how I reacted. I was just in complete disbelief that Kamala Harris didn't just choose a really good running mate. She chose the best possible choice that she could have made. I'm not saying that Tim Waltz is perfect. No politician is perfect. But out of the options, out of the possibilities, she chose the best one. And that disbelief that I felt when I woke up still hasn't faded away. And for the first time that I can remember, we have a Democratic presidential nominee in Kamala Harris who actually knows what the fuck she is doing. Thank God. For the first time in a really long time, I actually feel, dare I say, cross my fingers, knock on wood, don't want to jinx it, hopeful. I feel hopeful. And it's really hard to process what just happened. I'm still in disbelief. And what's crazy is that Tim Waltz, out of all the Democrats, is probably the one Democrat who could actually unify the Democratic Party. He's never really tried to explicitly be Bernie Sanders 2.0, and he's always been viewed as more of a moderate. But what sets him apart from other Democrats is, one, his incredible record, and two, the relationships that he's had with both centrists and progressives. It's why both Nancy Pelosi and Bernie Sanders endorsed him for VP. It's why Joe Manchin and AOC both put out statements today praising Kamala Harris for this pick. Tim Waltz is like the one Democrat who can unite both factions of the party. He's effective when it comes to policy. He's also really effective when it comes to politics and messaging like Buttigieg, but he doesn't have the baggage. He's not going to come off as elitist. He's just a normal, affable guy with a really long list of accomplishments as governor of Minnesota, and he could represent a return to the FDR style of politics for Democrats that we've all been hoping for. That style of politics was killed off by Clinton in favor of triangulation and neoliberalism. But what we're seeing right now, this could be a paradigm shift for the Democratic Party. Not a guarantee, but it's a good sign. But if you're not convinced, let me just give you a couple of reasons why so many people love Tim Waltz. So Cori Bush's former political director tweeted out his record on transit. He built a new popular Amtrak line. He passed a clean energy law. He passed e-bike tax credits and erased deficits. In fact, Minnesota has a projected budget surplus of $3.7 billion, which is one of the reasons why a lot of centrist Democrats like him, because he's fiscally responsible. But the way that he got that surplus was in part due to him him raising taxes on corporations, which is why a lot of progressives happen to like him. Kyle Kalinske points out additional accomplishments from him. Universal free school meals, legal weed, tax rebates for working people, 12 weeks of paid family leave and sick leave. He banned gay conversion therapy, passed red flag laws and universal background checks for gun purchases. He passed automatic voter registration, free college. He banned forever chemicals, increased school funding, and did sectoral bargaining for nursing home workers. And this is by no means an exotic of list, but he also codified reproductive rights and he secured funding for housing. So his record on domestic issues is excellent. Now, I could nitpick here and there and point out how he did veto a bill that would have effectively established a minimum wage for Uber and Lyft drivers, but that's one blemish on an otherwise pro-union, pro-labor record. You're always going to find things that you disagree with when it comes to politicians, but for the most part on domestic issues, He's one of the best Democratic governors in the country, if not the best. But what about foreign policy? That's really important, too. Well, listen, I will say the caveat is that the bar is really low. But even with that being said, 
one of the best Democrats in the country on foreign policy. So journalist Ida Chavez put together a thread of some of his foreign policy positions and explains, in the House, Walls played a significant role in pushing back against a new war in Syria during both of the major pushes for U.S. involvement in 2013 and 2016. He was also a strong voice in defending Congress's war powers. She continues, Walls helped lead a larger group of House Democrats to urge Obama to not go to war in Syria, which was critical to undermining pressure that was building on Obama to wage a war he didn't want to fight. Walls co-sponsored all of the Yemen war powers resolutions and even co-sponsored a bill opposing the U.S.-backed coup in Honduras. When it comes to Cuba, Walls opposed aspects of Trump's policy, calling it short-sighted and misguided. He focused on opening markets for agricultural trade to benefit both Minnesota farmers and the Cuban people. On top of that, he also supported the Iran deal in 2015, which was working until Trump got in office and ripped it up. So he's to the left of Obama and Biden on foreign policy. Now, that's all well and good, but the real question is, where does he stand on Israel-Palestine? Because that right now is very important for obvious reasons. Now, expectedly, he has been a longtime supporter of Israel, a strong supporter of Israel. I don't think anybody's going to be surprised by that. But he still defers from other Democrats in pretty significant ways. As human rights attorney Qasem Rashid points out, Tim Walls was one of the first politicians to call for an immediate ceasefire and release of all hostages. And when asked about the uncommitted movement, he did not condemn them or demonize them. Instead, he said they're civically engaged and should be listened to. So even on that issue, he's better than other Democrats. And I want you to hear his full remarks about the uncommitted movement, because I think that what he says here has made major policy implications. Right now, 20% of the vote going to uncommitted. And we've seen that already in this primary in, um, in Michigan. What message are voters in your state trying to send to President Biden? And what do you want to see President Biden do in response? Yeah, look, they're engaged. We're really proud in Minnesota. Civic responsibility. We have some of the highest voter turnouts. These are voters that are deeply concerned, as we all are. The situation in Gaza is is intolerable. Um, and I think trying to find a solution, a lasting two-state solution, certainly the president's move towards humanitarian aid and asking us to get to a ceasefire, that's what they're asking to be heard. And that's what they should be doing. Uh, we've gone through this before, and we know that now we make sure we've got eight months. We start bringing these uh, folks back in. We listen to what they're saying. Uh, that's a healthy thing that's happening here. But I would note that uh, that the former president uh, lost twice as many votes here in Minnesota to Nikki Haley. And I've seen some of these exit polls out of North Carolina and others. Eighty percent of folks said they're not voting for him who voted for Nikki Haley. We'll get these folks back. I think it's take them seriously. Their message is clear that they think this is an intolerable situation and that we can do more. And I think the president's hearing that. He actually said on national television that the uncommitted movement needs to be taken seriously. That's amazing. Contrast that with Josh Shapiro, who compared campus protesters to the KKK. This is a major, major difference. And now he's on the top of the ticket with Kamala Harris. To have somebody at the top of the ticket that's that sensitive to the concerns of the base... This is just a new thing. As a longtime observer of politics, as I've said, I've been very disappointed with the Democratic Party, but them actually listening to the base and being sensitive to what the base wants and trying to shore up the base and get the base excited, that is a new thing. So Kamala choosing him, to me, signals two things. One, that the overt racism against Palestinians that we see in someone like Josh Shapiro, for example, that is no longer politically tenable for Democrats. In fact, it's a liability. And that's a really good sign saying that Palestinians are too battle minded. This is what Josh Shapiro said years ago, saying that they're too battle minded. That type of racism no longer going to fly. Second, it also signals that Kamala Harris is indicating that she wants to go in a different direction than Biden. And I don't expect her to defy him on this issue because she's still the vice president who's going to toe the line. But she's given us enough to assume that she doesn't want to be as bad on this issue as Biden. And now that Waltz is in her ear, while well, I have a little bit more confidence that things won't be as bad, I don't expect any president's foreign policy to be good, by the way, but I'll take less bad over awful, especially considering the genocidal comments that Trump has made and the way that he's literally using the word Palestinian as a slur. Now there's a distinction. Now, another reason why I've become such a huge fan of Tim Walls is more personal. 
He's been a longtime ally to the LGBTQ plus community, and he's really strong on trans issues, which is needed now more than ever. We don't need Democrats who are afraid of their own shadows and retreat. We need them to fight. And he didn't just fight. Walsh was one of the greatest fighters for trans rights. In March of last year, as Aaron Reed reports, he signed an executive order that made Minnesota a trans refugee state, meaning that he's going to protect gender affirming health care for all trans youth and trans people, and he would decline extradition requests and refuse to comply with subpoenas, meaning that if your family was forced to flee from a state like Florida or Texas, which is persecuting and prosecuting trans families, you would be legally protected in Minnesota because of what Tim Maltz did. But his support for queer people goes way back to before it was popular. So there's a 2018 article in the Star Tribune written by J. Patrick Kulikin about how Waltz was trying to bring Minnesotans together. And in this article, he talks about how Waltz used his straightness to stand up for gay people at a time when nobody liked gay people. And you really can't get a better ally than this. So let me read you a couple of paragraphs. Quote, Tim Walls was an enlisted soldier in the Minnesota National Guard in 1999 and defensive coordinator of the Moncado West High School football team. A student at the school where Walls taught geography wanted to start a gay straight alliance. This was three years after the president, a Democrat, signed a law forbidding same-sex marriage. Soldiers suspected of being gay in Walls' own unit could be discharged from the military. But Walls, now Minnesota's Democrat, Democratic candidate for governor, had seen the bullying some students endured and agreed to be the group's faculty advisor. Quote, it really needed to be the football coach who was the soldier and was straight and was married, Walt said. In other words, he would be a symbol that disparate worlds could coexist peacefully. Wow. So he stood up for gay people at a time when it was really unpopular to do so. Again, Bill Clinton had just signed the Defense of Marriage Act into law and don't ask, don't tell. And it was really popular to hate on gay people. But Tim Waltz, he supported them, even though it wasn't politically expedient. And the way that he stood up for gay people when it was unpopular, he's doing that for trans people right now. During a time like this, you couldn't dream of a better ally than Tim Waltz. But there's more, because in 2010, he also took a really strong stance against Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was signed into law by Clinton again. So listen to what he says. Mr. Speaker, I yield 30 seconds to a gentleman from Minnesota. The highest ranking enlisted soldier ever to serve in the United States Congress, Command Sergeant Major Tim Walsh. The gentleman from Minnesota is recognized for 30 seconds. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the gentleman for this. Greatest privilege I've had in my life was serving this nation for almost 25 years in uniform. I know how important it is to fill our military with qualified, professional, and motivated volunteers. We are blessed in this nation. That's exactly what we have. It's time for us to honor their professionalism and know that they're ready to end this discriminatory practice. I support this amendment because it allows for the study of implementation and allows the Department of Defense to implement it after their study is done. We do this all the time in the military. It took us six months to change from hats to berets. The process will be orderly. It will be right down the line the way it needs to be. And at the end of the day, don't question their ability to do it. I support the amendment. Incredible. So he has a long, long history of fighting for the disadvantaged. He's not like J.D. Vance, who just developed a political identity a couple of years ago. He has actual principles. He actually cares about helping people. But one quality about him that I also admire is his willingness to listen and adapt if necessary. So if there is a particular policy disagreement that you have with him, I'm sure you do. I'm sure I do. In fact, I do have policy disagreements with him. The good news is that He's actually willing to hear you out and even change if he thinks you're making a compelling case. So here's one very powerful example of this. But today I have a probably a more important job. My job today is to be dad to a 17-year-old daughter named Hope who's here. And Hope and I... Hope woke up like many of you did five weeks ago and dad said, Dad, you're the only person I know who's in elected office. You need to stop what's happening with this. I'll take my kick in the butt for the NRA. I spent 25 years in the Army and I hunt. And I gave the money back. And I'll tell you what I have been doing. I've been voting for common sense legislation that protects the Second Amendment. But we can do background checks. We can do CDC research. We can make sure we don't have reciprocal carry among states. And we can make sure that those weapons of war that I carried in war is the only place where those weapons are at. We won't do it by dividing us. We will doing it by bringing in responsible gun owners from the side to make this happen. Give me the opportunity to, jo to earn your endorsement. We will make these things happen in Minnesota and make sure that this state continues its long progressive tradition. Just to reiterate, he was a pro-gun Democrat with an A rating from the NRA. But then 
Parkland happened. And his daughter convinced him that it was the wrong position to have. So what did he do? He gave the money that he took from the NRA to charity and promised to pass gun safety laws. And as governor, guess what he did? He passed gun safety laws. Now, in response to David Hogg, a Parkland survivor who shared this video on Twitter, he says, it's true. I'm a veteran, a hunter, and a gun owner, but I'm also a dad. And for many years, I was a teacher. I know basic gun safety isn't a threat to my rights. It's about keeping our kids safe. I had an A rating from the NRA. Now I get straight Fs and I sleep just fine. Ask yourself, when was the last time a politician did something like this? Can you imagine any Republican doing this? When was the last time a politician in either party defied their donors and went in the opposite direction because they felt like it was the right thing to do? I mean, it happened, sure, but it's very, very rare. So this tells me that if he's vice president and does something I don't like, which will happen, it's inevitable, you know, if he wins, he's willing to hear us out. He's going to be willing to listen to us. Now, part of what changed his mind was his daughter, Hope, as he mentioned. And when he was running for Congress back in 2006, he released the following radio ad called Hope. And this is really touching, and it shows you how human he is and why it's important to elect people who are just human beings and actually have emotions. Hi, my name is Tim Walsh, and I'm running for Congress here in southern Minnesota for several important reasons. But today I'd like to tell you about one issue that's very personal to me. I am a retired command sergeant major in the Minnesota National Guard. And after years of firing artillery, I sustained severe inner ear damage. Because I have good health insurance provided through my employer, I was able to have surgery on my ear. As my ear healed, my hearing was gradually restored. One morning, several weeks after the surgery, I awoke to a sound I couldn't identify. I asked my wife what I was hearing and she told me, Tim, that's your four-year-old daughter, Hope. You see, Hope wakes up singing every morning, but I had never heard that sound until that day. I'm running for Congress because I believe we as a country have a moral obligation to ensure that every father can hear his daughter sing, that every citizen receives the best care our medical community has to offer. I'm Tim Walls, and I approve this message because I've heard how important health care is to everyone. That's Kamala's running mate. So great on policy, great on politics, and he represents a stark difference between Democrats and Republicans. For example, this is a picture of Arkansas Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders signing legislation that loosens child labor laws. Now, you can see how thrilled the children are by the looks on their faces. It's just sad, but it's also funny. Now, juxtapose that with Tim Walls, who signed free school lunches into law. Look at the reaction that he got. This is Democrats versus Republicans. It's an easy sell to voters. And unlike other Democrats, he's able to articulate these clear differences. And he has been doing that. For example, he was asked by Jake Tapper on CNN if his record of being progressive and passing progressive policies would hurt Kamala because he'd be viewed as too liberal. And his response was perfect. What a monster. Kids are eating, eating and having full bellies so they can go learn. And women are making their own health care decisions. And uh, we're a top five business state. And uh, we also rank in the top three of happiness. Look, they're going to label whatever they're going to label. He's going to roll it out, mispronounce names, you know, to try and make the case. The fact of the matter is where you see the policies that uh, Vice President Harris was a part of making, Democratic governors across the country executed those policies and quality of life is higher. The economies are better. All of those things. Educational attainment is better. So, yeah. My kids are going to eat here and you're going to have a chance to go to college and you're going to have an opportunity to live where we're working on reducing carbon emissions. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have personal incomes that are higher and you're going to have health insurance. So if that's where they want to label me, uh, I, I'm more than happy to take the label. That's the message right there. Force Republicans to attack you for doing really good and popular things. Get them to attack you for feeding kids and protecting reproductive health care. I promise you. That is not going to resonate with regular people. Now, aside from his policies, he's also just damn good at politics, which is new for Democrats also. So, you know, you often hear about how Buttigieg is really good at messaging and combating Republican attacks, and that's true. But listen to how Walls talks about Republicans and the way that he defends Harris from their attacks, because I would argue he's better than Buttigieg on messaging. Who's asking for this crazy stuff? Who's asking to 
raise the price of insulin? Who's asking to get rid of birth control? They do these focus groups or whatever. Who's sitting in a bar in Racine, you know, Wisconsin saying, you know what we really need? We need to ban Animal Farm. Nobody is. They're talking about real things. So when these guys get in situations in front of real people and trying to pretend like they know what people are going through, they've got nothing to offer. And no one can picture them in their own lives. I keep, I brought this thing up that Donald Trump tries to mock uh, Vice President Harris for laughing. And, mm. and I made the point, you never see this guy laugh. You never see him do these normal things. Imagine when I go home at night, I pick up the Frisbee and throw it and my, my dog catches, he comes over, he gets the belly rub for being a good boy. Picture these guys doing that kind of stuff. They just can't. And what it allows us to do is we hear you or you're coming from. So he takes every single attack and he turns it into an asset for Democrats. He's just damn good. He knows how to play politics better than any Democrat in my lifetime. But unlike other Democrats, he's also good at policy. Usually if you have a Democrat that's pretty good at messaging, then they're bad at policy. So there's always like a negative and a positive. Like Gavin Newsom, for example, I think he's pretty effective at messaging when it comes to Republicans and Republican attacks. But when it comes to policy, not too good. Tim Walz, he's got both, right? He's the uh, double threat, if you will. But again, I want to be clear. You should never worship any politician, including Tim Waltz, because he is far from perfect. And it's just not realistic to expect a politician to be as good as we all want them to be. Having said that, though, Kamala Harris picking Tim Waltz changes the fucking game. She's signaling her intent to take the Democratic Party in an entirely new direction. And that, to me, is worth celebrating. So if you've been dissatisfied with the Democratic Party for years, as I've been, let them know that you approve of this new direction. Let them know that you want to reward good behavior and reward them with your vote. You can reassess in four years whether or not she's actually trying to take us in a new direction and whether or not this is a head fake. But as for this election, it's no longer just about defeating fascism. It's also about building a more progressive, populist, and resilient Democratic Party that's actually capable of taking on a future fascist that comes after Trump. We actually now have a reason to be a little bit hopeful for the first time in a very long time. And relishing in this moment, being hopeful doesn't make you a fake leftist or a phony progressive. It makes you a human being. And after so many years of misery and looming fascism, after seeing right after right being stripped away from us, things are finally, for the first time, looking up. We're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And again, we don't have a perfect system. We have a pretty fucked up system. So I don't expect things to get drastically better if Kamala Harris wins. And I know that I'm going to be disappointed and will inevitably criticize her and Tim Waltz if they win. But we've just been thrown a life vest. And the question is, are we going to grab on? The boat, you know, there's some flaws with the boat. I don't know how long it'll last. But for right now, We've been thrown a life vest and we have a chance to not drown. I'm going to grab on and I would encourage you to do the same. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? 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 <laughs> tree? They not like us. Tree? Tree? You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? tree?